I'm so glad you brought it up. It's difficult to answer. I never expect you jump straight into that. Disappointing that a lot of people in my generation. That's a very interesting question. <coughs> I would call myself a minority because I'm toxic competition. Yeah. I'm at Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, wow. Yeah. So aliens, I thought they didn't care much for me. A farewell gift. They each wrote a sentence for me put it together as a necklace and wow. and just put it on my neck. I was like. Oh my god, that is super sweet. So we have to talk about feminism. Okay, that's a very interesting question. I do want a family. So my mom has this dream of starting a Xiwang Xiaoxu. It's like a charity. I feel like nowadays in the world, too many confrontations, too many battles. People are trying to yell at each other. I remember this saying that my politics teacher, those people in the past, but nowadays people are religion in China, feeling cute, stronger emotional capacity to you know cater for everyone's needs. Listen to his podcast. By the way, I'm doing a lot of advertisement for you. Listen to her <laughs> podcast, by the way. <laughs> that's a good question. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my podcast, Coffee's on Me, David Kwan, where I strive to give guests legacy-worthy interviews that listeners can enjoy while cooking, commuting, relaxing, or walking their pets. We're at the beginning of May week, and um, exams are finished here in Cambridge, so people really get to enjoy the sun and spending time with friends. Admittedly, this is like the most exhausted I have been all year because my sleep routine is disrupted and I feel like there's like a sense of pressure to relax and to have fun, which ironically has made me more tired and hay fever hasn't really helped. Um, but my guests and I are enjoying our ice latte together and also a massive croissant, which is um, <laughs> fantastic. This is a bit, bit emotional that this is likely my final podcast episode um, here while, while I'm in Cambridge. Um, and I feel particularly grateful for my guest today and it almost feels a bit like going full circle because um, she's from the very city that I was born in and obviously a place that means a lot to me so I'm looking forward to delving deeper into that but um, just before we begin I feel very blessed that we are now approaching a hundred thousand podcast downloads um, please know that I don't take any of your time feedback and support for granted because when I started this passion project at a low point of my time in Cambridge, I was genuinely motivated by three founding ideals. Number one, purpose of giving. Number two, learning from others. And number three, sharing of stories. These three aspirations still make up the content description for every single episode. Indeed, the opportunities to strive to give my courageous and insightful guests legacy-worthy interviews over coffee, tea, bubble tea, water, juice, or whatever it is, despite my many inadequacies, have been a tremendous privilege that imbues me with gratitude. I know that I will look back and listen back to laugh at how naive I am, but I genuinely maintain... Oh... I know that I will look back and listen back to laugh at how naive I am. But if you have been enjoying the discussions on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts, thank you. And please do consider leaving a review and nominating a guest by contacting me via my link tree, David Kwan. Seeing this podcast on people's Spotify raps or receiving positive messages about the guests give me tremendous fulfillment. I cannot thank my wonderful guests enough for their courage and insights. I genuinely maintain the deep conviction that this passion project, if wholly true to those founding motivations about giving, learning and sharing, is a worthwhile pursuit. So on to my incredibly talented, ambitious and important guest. Jania Yane is a first year economic student at Emmanuel College, University of Cambridge. She believes in the power of knowledge, arts love and altruism to fight back uncertainties and isolation in a changing world. Growing up in Xi'an, the histor uh, historical capital city of ch 13 Chinese dynasties, her beliefs were shaped by her four-year project advocating for local, cultural, intangible heritages. This endeavour evolved into an educational campaign that reached thousands of local students. As a natural risk taker in search of rewards, she continually rejects comfort and mediocrity. Amongst the many roads that diverted in life, she somehow ended up on the roads less taken, leaving Gokar for her dream of attending Cambridge, assuming the role of a female CEO by founding a startup, and dismissing the peer pressure for finance careers to stop and reflect. 
Currently, she serves as Vice President at Cambridge University Entrepreneurs Cube, along with committee roles at various university societies. She also enjoys museums, podcasts, piano, debating, sunbathing, meeting random people and dogs, and sometimes playing Tetris. Putting a memorable closure to her first year at university, she's grateful for this conversation with David Kwan to learn more about herself and the world. Jenny, um, welcome to my podcast, Coffee's Only David Kwan. Thank you for having me, David. How's the food? Good, fabulous, a massive croissant. (laughs) How has the rest period been after exams? You finished on the 9th, I believe? Yeah, I did. It was quite chill. I find Cambridge more attractive than during term time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, one request you had for me was to make it a deep conversation. So let's start there. Um, What does love mean to you? Love. It's difficult to answer. I never expect you jump straight into that, but um, I think love is something that helps to energize me, gives life meaning. Um, You know, in life there are so many occurrences that could depart people, like going to another school, changing a job and stuff. But I think love is a force that continues to bond us together. So I think that is really significant. Um, so what do you love then? Sorry? What do you love? What do I love? I love a lot of things in this world. (coughs) I see the cat there. She's really cute. I love the people, especially you just mentioned the Cambridge community, something that you're going to miss. So really resonates with that people and just nature and books and artworks, a lot of things and I feel like those things are the connections that go through time between people. Do you feel loved? I do feel loved a lot of the time. Um, I've met so many amazing people in my first year and I'm really, really grateful for that. My dos, my tutors, they help me a lot. And especially those amazing, amazing people I met, say IQ and all those communities. I just continuously feel grateful and humbled. So we've obviously worked together in Q, um, your um, vice president. (laughs) Um, So unfortunately, you've had to deal with me quite a bit um, this year. Um, Is that the first like major university society that you've been a part of? Or have you um, been a part of many? I I see that you had committee roles at various (laughs) other societies. Yes, Um, I do. Um, But Q is the first and the biggest society that I've been involved in and it has certainly provided me so much learning opportunities and I really enjoy working with you. Um, Yeah, Q is just like this big family or big platform where I can just deliver my visions amongst so many amazing people. Um, You were focused on competition and we Mm -hmm. hosted the 20k competition. Yes. And that's actually the biggest in Q history, even though we've only had, what, 10 weeks to do it during, you know, in the lead up to Mm -hmm. exams. Were you surprised at how we were able to pull it all together from that first meeting in my room? Or were you just, yeah, how how do you feel in retrospect about that process? Because we were under quite a lot of time pressure. Yeah. I mean, given all the effort you have collectively put into this, I'm not surprised at all that it turns out to be a success. But at the same time, just in retrospect, when I reflect upon it's only 10 weeks, it's just the first meeting I can still remember vividly we are sitting in this exact place. It just gave me that kind of, you know, um, surprise afterwards. And I'm super, super um, proud that we, we are able to push this thing together mm. um let's revert back to university a bit later but um mm-hmm. i want to chat more about xian you know i was yeah. born there i spent my first five years there um it means a lot to me um for some of the very reasons that you mentioned about it being such a historical mm-hmm. and culturally significant city and i was wondering if you could maybe if someone i'm sure you've been asked this at cambridge right? tell me about your hometown xian oh, what would yeah. you say well, first thing is the good food. Mm. Obviously, Rojiangwoliangpi, you name it. So good. And also the history. Um, it just gives me that kind of strong belonging. It is my city. So I used to went to this 
um, Shanxi Lishi Bu Guan or the yeah. History Museum of Shanxi, the province. When I was little, I felt to understand most of it. It's just like touring around. But then as I grew up, I constantly returned to this place. And I just, it's, it's like a landmark which um, signals my growth. And yeah, I just feel super connected to this city and the history. And yeah, apart from that, so Xi'an is like this um, middle-sized city that is not really economically advanced. So I am really aware of the, um, say, sort of drawbacks that it has put on me. Because um, international education in China is like really, really um, distributed unequitably or unfairly. So you can see most of the Chinese students are from bigger cities such as Shanghai, Beijing, um, not Xi'an. So I am extremely humbled by my background, but at the same time, I'm hugely grateful for my parents and all the support I've got from my friends and school and teachers. So Xi'an is like one of like the four like, you know, for four great ancient capitals in yes. China and growing up did you feel that sense of like significance where for much of like Chinese civilization this is the heart of the country? Um I didn't have that kind of general great feeling that it is that sig significant but mm. you know growing up <coughs> I've seen so many local artists performing um Chinese puppet Mm. Like it's a very uh, traditional arts form, mm. and also those um Chinese operas. It's like so many things embedded in my daily life, and then through the accumulation of those small moments that I got to learn that Xi'an or China Chinese culture is something I really embrace and feel a sense of belonging. So the city is also like you know the starting point of mm -hmm. like the Silk Road and yeah, also home of like the Terracotta <laughs> Warriors. Oh uh, yeah, which you know just one of the world wonders and miracles uh -huh. um as a child growing up in xian did you um take a lot of pride to understand these culturally significant like world heritage sites or was it just so common that you didn't really think much of it um yes so personally i did strive to <coughs> understand those things because i feel like they can they constitute a very significant part of my background, a part of my identity. Mm. Where, um, it's just my home, you know. Mm. But at the same time, I felt it quite um, disappointing that a lot of people in my generation, they're just um, so addicted to the internet, to the, the bigger world around them, mm. that they fail to acknowledge this neighborhood <coughs> around them and... Um, yeah, that's that's sort of the reason why I started my project on the cultural, um, intangible cultural heritages, so that we could, you know, just influence the students around us. We never thought that it would go this big, like a big thing around campus, but it started off as a little project sort of thing, <coughs> and then it just went bigger. What was the initial project? Like, so Did you propose it? Did you... Did you lead it? Was it a group of people? Just tell me about that project. Yeah, it was a group of people. I led it. And it started off in my uh, second year during middle school. And initially, we just invited local artists to our school. And we invited students all together, have, have seminars. And it was quite interactive. Mm. And then it went bigger. It became a tradition in our school. And then we had this handover between the committees. It's like we are having sort of... Um, heritage or legacy amongst ourselves so it's sort of it's sort of analogous to that in Q we are doing a startup ourselves but and at the same time we are a startup mm -hmm. that's what I'm feeling so second year middle school were you like 14 15 yeah um, I was 14 and the artists you invite are they just local artists and what do they come and speak about and yeah yeah, they were local artists. They're like in their sixties or seventies, and um, usually ju they just stay in this corner near the city wall, where they just gather and perform to the tourists, and we invited them to the school. They had 
um, we have this local artist who is really good at paper cutting, you know, it's like using red paper to cut shapes in China, um, which has really um, significant <coughs> meanings in China, such as um, wishes for well-being and happiness. Mm. So yeah, we invite the students to see around them and I believe it has such a big impact upon the, mm. the views we have. So speaking to those 60, 70 year olds, obviously mm -hmm. they grew up in quite different yeah. economic circumstances and historical circumstances. Mm -hmm. How did you feel like the upbringing of Xi'an, like the upbringing experience of Xi'an had evolved in just a few decades? That's a very interesting question. I didn't really think about that in the past, but now I think of it. Um, <coughs> So, Xi'an in the past, um, I say, it's like, you mentioned Silk Road, it's like um, a very open place to all sorts of international ideas and culture and stuff. And at the same time, it has so many local um, artists sitting around. So, I, I, I imagine that they grown up in this sort of... Um, diverse culture but at the same time they have something to stick to whilst nowadays Xi'an is like more of a tourist city and then my generation is more like um, we have internet we have um, huge pressure from school so it's more like um, we restrain ourselves to the world that we want to see um, it's say it's a I don't know it's more like um, you know, we have access to the big road, mm. but then we fail to see the neighborhood. Mm. Whilst compared to the past, those older generations, they live in their neighborhood. Yeah. It's a strong sense of identity. Home. Um, yeah, identity. Okay. Yeah. And um, I, I know exactly where you went to school. I, I hung around, <laughs> around there so much as a child. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a nice area. It um, is. <laughs> but um, schooling in China is uh -huh. obviously quite intense it is so i was wondering like in your childhood um did you get much time to explore your neighborhood like you know the nature and walking a part of the different streets and just being spontaneous and random mm -hmm. or were your days more structured around educational pursuits so i would call myself a minority because i'm really thankful for my mom who is really open-minded um a lot of kids around me they started attending say olympic math classes it's like actual mm. classes outside of school as early as grade three in primary school mm. but me myself um i usually travel like around around the city of xian like to qinli which is a great oh, mountain yeah, yeah. yeah you know that i'm walking my dog there and yeah i spend a lot of my childhood days just playing around in my neighborhood okay. hanging out with my friends and and so there's unstructured play it was yeah just, you had the day or afternoon or weekend to yeah just i had the whole weekend to myself wow it's really unstructured but at the same time because i know that i want to play out the weekend i have yeah. to finish all my things during the week okay. and that is something that helps to give me structure now <laughs> you know <laughs> right so how old were you when you were still having those free weekends i'm assuming when you got to like high school mm -hmm. you probably didn't want to no, have a weekend <laughs> <laughs> i don't have that anymore um i still have those weekends to myself until say grade five in primary school wow and then i have to attend those classes because we have this thing um called the middle school entrance exams which is quite competitive so mm. we have to do that it's like toxic competition okay <laughs> so why did your mum not put that pressure on you from the beginning because obviously mm -hmm. in china as you in your words toxic yeah. competition like <laughs> there, there's that phrase like you don't want to uh, like, you don't want to yeah, yeah, yeah. start uh, lose at the starting point so year five is actually like, at that point, mm -hmm. a lot of things are already set. Yeah. So why does she allow you to have so much freedom in space? She just <coughs> thinks that children are meant to play. And that's it. So she thinks, you know, taking rest is as important as you push yourself to all your work and studies. So 
that has certainly taught me a lot during these days. And now in retrospect, I'm really thinking back about the sort of competition we have in China and how that is carried forward to the Chinese students studying abroad. Mm. Um, I feel like it's probably due to the scarcity of resources in China where you really have to compete mm. really, really intensely in order to fight for an, um, say, entrance to a good middle school. Mm. And you know the word neijuan, it's like yeah. toxic competition. Yeah. So in China, you have to um, spend a lot of time on, say, an event A in order to gain a ticket to event B. But mm. A and B are unrelated. Mm. So a lot of effort is lost in the way. Yeah, I think nature and someone described mm. it to me as like, uh, you start with a group of bus drivers mm-hmm. and then one, one bus driver got a PhD in, <laughs> in, in a field that you don't yeah. need to, but then other bus drivers then feel they need to also get a PhD. <laughs> and eventually you need to be at least a PhD to drive a bus. <laughs> yeah, it's like pushing up the standards. Yeah. yeah. Unnecessary. Okay. Mm-hmm. I guess, like, I'm curious in your upbringing, mm-hmm. like, it's the the backdrop that, you know, you finished as valedictorian out of 180 students, so <laughs> you ended up excelling, and you've yeah. obviously done very well, and you, I think you were basically school captain, equivalent, I don't, class president, <laughs> I don't know what oh, you called it. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's really cool to hear that you had that play, you had the freedom to explore, and you were a bit almost countercultural. I wish. And our brain, but yet you ended up being on top from uh, the, the metrics that they were pursuing. So I'm just trying to understand, like, what maybe just how you got there. So if we say mm. in your childhood, what did your, like, parents, what did they do? And what were they recommending you, like, as a little kid? Like, they obviously prioritised play. <laughs> care a lot about academics did they yeah just paint your home life and home environment yeah so my parents were both teaching in the university so i grew up in the university neighborhood it was quite (coughs) quite um it's not very famous it's not until that it's like yeah Yeah. so basically i ended up in this community where you know a lot of people around me are like constantly learning and have this really open mindset to all those intellectual discussions so i feel like that is sort of um, a call to myself and then speaking of i spend a lot of time like um in leisure in playing ra- rather than studying so i think um as i mentioned it just gives me the pressure that i have to be efficient in my work and studies so that i can play and yeah it's just teaching me and in another aspect um i think leisure itself also adds to your productivity you know when you rest well you can do work well so it's like a very uh vicious cycle going on and um yeah um you mentioned that i uh, sort of excelled in school um i well I, I actually engaged in a lot of school activities, probably more than I should, considering that I'm in the more of a um, competitive Gaokao system before, beforehand. And um, yeah, I feel like I'm joining a lot of extracurricular activities, doing all those side projects, just give me that kind of energy that also helps me to do well in my work studies were you getting good grades in primary school i sort of did um i went to the u.s to study for one year during my grade four mm-hmm. and yeah when i came back i i sort of got the lowest mark in my life <laughs> like in my primary school life which is like <laughs> oh my god um i had to learn the chinese you know those chinese characters and spellings and um, that i learned over the year and um I I started off quite low, but then I ca- I caught up. So where were you in the US? Um, at Nashville, Tennessee. Oh wow! It's like country music, very yeah. chill vibes. How did you? Why Why did you move there? Um, my mom was a visiting sto- scholar. Um, at one of the yeah. universities. So. I and that. did that year open your eyes to a different way of life and just yeah, the American sure style? Yeah. Yeah, it sure did. So. 
Um, when I first came there, I barely speak any English. Okay. So it was one year of isolation for me. Okay. It sort of embedded in me that kind of quality where I am very cool with myself. Yeah. Um, you know, during the, uh, during Friday, there was this kind of recess time where everyone sort of played together. Yeah. And then I was all alone by myself, so I oh, went to no. the library. <laughs> I went to the library. I was su such a nerd. I went to the makerspace just to, you know, just to doodle around and stuff. Right. Yeah. Did you want to fit in and... Of course I did. Okay. But, but there was no one really to help you. Um, it was like the cultural and language barrier okay. first. Um... There was someone to help me, but she was a teacher, so <laughs> it's, it's not really that helpful. Okay. Um, but then after this year, I sort of um, realized that all the kids in my class, they were actually quite friendly. And it's just the way, it's like when you engage your, so engage in your social life, it's like looking inside a mirror. Mm. If you feel very open-minded, feel very friendly, then people will also reflect that sort of friendliness back to you. Yep. Yeah, and another takeaway from that year is like, um, I became more open minded, all sorts of um, different ways of yeah, living, yeah, different ways of living, different cultures. Um, because in the US, they're especially in Nashville, people are more chill, um, sort of way, so they had a lot of summer p parties, open music going on, yeah. and also I met people speaking different languages yeah. of different skin that color, look different. And you're a yeah. minority, yeah, I'm sort of a minority, um. Yeah, but I, I'm i feeling very blessed for this one year abroad because it sort of embedded me in that kind of... Um, no, there's a bigger world outside. Yeah, there's a bigger world. I want to explore it. Wow. Yeah, and that sort of added to my mm. dream for Cambridge. So at that point, mm -hmm. the, you, you would have still learned English at school, but of course that's not the same as being in a full English environment. Or, or did you not even have any background in English at that point? Uh, I had, but it was quite different, like, you know, actually living and speaking in English. Yeah. So. Okay. Was there many Chinese students there? Um, there was a few. It's just like <coughs> one or two in mm. one year, so not many. Okay. And when you were, like, having that initial cultural shock, which is totally understandable, <laughs> yeah. did you yeah. speak to mum about your experiences and did she give any tips and advice and did you know that was only going to be one year or could it be more permanent i knew that it's going to be one year okay. so initially i was really really against going to school you know i was you know it's just, just one feeling year. so alien okay and my mom was quite tough on this i suppose i forgot what kind of guidance she gave to me but it sort of ended up well so the thing about my mom is that she tends to give me a lot of autonomy over my uh studies and play so um whilst another uh, like a lot of other parents of children at my age they used to like tutor their stu their, their child during their homework and they teach their children to do stuff my mom didn't do that she oh. just you decide for yourself and i sort of learned to so you're like a seven year old and she's like you decide for yourself <laughs> your future is in your hands <laughs> sort of like that yeah <laughs> what's that so how, how busy was her with her work? Because university lecturing, mm -hmm. you know, it depends, right? She wasn't that busy. Okay. Um, my mum, I think, until I was, say, 15 or something, she actually spent a lot of effort in me that I didn't see. She's like, you know, the art of Chinese Kung Fu where you give a very soft attack or punch, but you get a lot of... Um, power yeah power inside that yeah. I think she's that sort of person so she knows where exactly to trigger you and to motivate punch you <laughs> to punch you literally yeah. or metaphorically <laughs> metaphorically <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um, she's like this female who is really um, so I, I think she's um, so the, the way I mentioned it or the way I described her it's like she didn't put much effort in me she let me to grow up mm. very freely but actually but, she was but she actually she did a lot of stuff that I didn't see when i was younger so i think um until i was 15 um she wasn't able to focus solely on her work so after that she mm. she's like catching up on her academia stuff mm. so you ruined her career a little bit no I'm kidding. <laughs> i did i sort of did <laughs> so i feel like i have this responsibility you know and um, when i was little she gave me this bigger world yeah. so when i grew up i just wanted to 
give it back to her and show her my world. So, okay, I I, mm-hmm. I understand as a kid it's hard to yeah. fully appreciate mm-hmm. the demands of a parent, and lots of people say that once they become a parent, they realize, wow, my parents <laughs> have done so much. Exactly. Was there like a key moment when you started to really see the sacrifice that you hadn't seen of her before? Or did, was that just a gradual, you getting older and more mature? Um, there was one distinct moment. <coughs> so that was straight after I finished my Cambridge interview. So at that time, she was actually more anxious than I was. And I thought she was like uh, pondering upon whether I could enter Cambridge or not. Um, you know, about the results and stuff. Yeah. But afterwards, she told me that she didn't care about the results at all. She said that she just knew if I didn't get in, I will be really, really sad. And she was really worried that I'm not going to be, I'm going to be unhappy. Mm-hmm. She's worried about my emotional states rather than its results. Wow. And that is like so, the moment. That is love, isn't it? That is love. <laughs> <laughs> we finally got the answer in our half an hour in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that parental love of just naturally empathizing and putting yourself in their shoes and yeah. i'm sure she would have done she would have been happy to do anything just to ensure your happiness which is beautiful um, that parental love um okay so you mm-hmm. you had that year in america I had it. did you do any like extracurriculars there because i think in western schools they mm-hmm. really encourage playing yeah i did so i started off playing bass clarinet oh, yeah. so the thing is when i was like um Rehearsing, uh, it's not rehearsing, it's like um, first, first entry in the band. The teacher asked me what sort of interest, instrument you wanted to play. I knew nothing about the names of interest, instruments. <laughs> so I just picked it because I thought it sounded nice. And then in that band, we play easy pieces such as the theme music of Star Wars. Oh, yeah. um, it wasn't that huge, but it just gave me that kind of power in a community <coughs> where you're like all together doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. I, I, I believe you can really resonate with that because I know you are an amazing trombone player. Is it? I'm a trombone player, but we can take away amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just <laughs> being too humble. Okay, uh-huh. and then... Okay, so you finished the year, at the end mm-hmm. of that year, as you were saying goodbye to your classmates, teachers in the place, did you feel... Like, you're going to miss it? Or were you happy to go back to China? <laughs> or was I'm it a massive farewell party for Jenny, the, the library girl? <laughs> <laughs> I love her that. Well, I sure did miss it. Um, you know, all my, all, my, all my classmates at that time, I thought they didn't care much about me because I was, like, super nerdy, sitting there <laughs> doing my own things. But then they made this um, little farewell, <coughs> gi- a farewell gift. It's like... They each wrote a sentence for me and then they put it into a, you know, put it together as a necklace and and just put it on my neck. I was like, oh my God, that is super sweet. Yeah, I'm sure gonna miss it. It's like, it's not, it's like not only about the people, the actual places, but it's more about the, the last period of time where I get to really chill. So um, you recognise that. I recognise that. When you go back, it's going to be... I know, I know. My mom was like trying to get me into Olympic mass books, but I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Wow. And then when I got back at grade four, I really, I, I mean, grade five, I had a lot to catch up with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you, your Chinese went backwards in that year because you didn't really did. get to speak it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's so cool. Have you still got that necklace? Yeah, I did. And Amazing what were some of the things that kids wrote? Um, something along the lines that Chinia is really nice because she let me borrow her crayons. Wow. <laughs> that is so true. true where, yeah. you know, what people notice and appreciate at the yeah. end is often the smallest of interactions, the smallest acts of kindness. Like I had a similar thing where mm-hmm. when I finished my year as a school captain of my school, mm. Um, I had a farewell gift as well, and it was Aww. a book of 186 pages of the whole school writing messages in it. And, oh my god! And that it was just so obviously so emotional. But yeah. the one thing that struck me was that almost none of the comments said like, "Oh, you're so good at basketball," or, "You're so good <laughs> at music," or yeah. "You know, I loved your speeches," or 
you know, it was none of the grand things that mm-hmm. you usually take pride of yeah, in achieving. Exactly. But it was always like, oh, the high five you gave me or that birthday card or, you know, <laughs> that time when you sat with me to just chat or play handball together. And it's just like, wow, like kids of all ages see, oh, remember yeah. those things. I think Mayor Angelo said like, uh-huh. people don't remember what you say, but people remember how you made them feel. And I think it sounds like you had that impact where you as a foreigner coming in yeah, clearly also brought something different to them and it touched them in a way that you, perhaps, they weren't even able to show immediately, but they clearly <laughs> recognise this. That's really beautiful. Yeah, that is beautiful. I really resonate with what you just said. I feel like a very fundamental similarity between us is like we all have this passion for humours not about the grand things Mm. but like those small moments that connect us together Mm. which you know you gave me a gift on at the end of my (laughs) exams this spring which i don't remember what you wrote on the card but i remember how i felt yeah me too i remember about your card as well it's like your friend david i was like oh that is so sweet and beautiful that's awesome okay so you hopped on the plane back to china yep and then you back to school (laughs) And then were you like, damn, like, now I need to catch up, now I need to... Were you daunted by the task? And how did you describe your one-year America with your classmates who didn't have that experience? Hmm. So when I came back, it was, yeah, true, quite daunting. But I couldn't remember that, you know, very negative emotions. All I remember was, like, me and my friends competing against one another, like in a very childish way, who can finish this math problem first. Mm. And it, yeah, it was quite fun. And I say I'm really, really privileged compared to my classmates because many of them didn't get so, that sort of opportunity. And that really helped me to gain a lot of um, competitive advantage in English. That helped me to strive in later years, say middle and high school. Mm. So I am really aware of that kind of privilege I had at that time. So yeah, even in Xi'an, in such a small city, I'm still one of the very privileged group mm. who who were able to seize a bigger world around me and who had also the resources, the platform, the financial um, resources from my parents that allowed me to come to Cambridge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of us at Cambridge, we are really privileged. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you, you started middle school mm-hmm. and then you still did your you know projects, as you mentioned. <laughs> and then you were also working hard academically. What were your goals like the beginning of high school, like what did you want to achieve? Did you, because uh, when you were in the Gokao process, like mm-hmm. were you aiming for like Tsinghua, Beda, <laughs> or? Well, when you were in the Gokao system, it seems like your life is centered around Tsinghua, Beda. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, I was like quite rebellious. I tried to fight back that. So, I the way I situated myself was like, I really wanted to do well in my academics, but at the same time, I wanted to have all those sort of extracurriculars, all those people activities mm. around me, because I think that is sort of the thing that's, you know, continuously um, inspiring me and energizing me. Okay. And do you do any voluntary work beyond the cultural heritage project? Um, that was the biggest voluntary work I had. Um, but beside that, it's not, it's not nothing really big. It's like, I mean, serving as a cl- class captain or like class lead is sort of my voluntary work in mm. some sense. Because um, well, all the other kids are like studying. I ha- um, we have to go to meetings and do stuff. It's yeah. like some sort of sacrifice of my personal studying or free time. Mm. But it's like very rewarding. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. And um, how does student leadership work in Chinese uh, high schools? Like, I know that you were <laughs> like founder and president of the school leadership society. <laughs> um, just paint, like, w- w- does people want to be a representative? Do people want to be a leader? What's the processes? Like, is it voting? Is it selection? Tell me about, yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought it up. Um, I mean... I think the hierarchy in China is more like top down instead of bottom up. So in primary school, it's more like um, 
it's more like unofficial we're the the class leader like appointed by the teachers who see us more vol um, who see us like more able i was like i was this leader of my i don't know how do you call it like oh yeah yeah you, you clean the class and i was like the leader of that little group and then my teacher saw my potential and she's like you you can come and try this out and i wow. tried but as we grew up it's like more the voting took place um yeah but but it's like still i have that idea of you know hierarchy where class leader is more like the bridge um between the student body and the say the dean of the school so we're like the conductors of their i don't know commands or notices to the students that sort of thing and when i came to cambridge i joined a lot of other societies and i just constantly feel so blessed that we're like so equal and everyone has very um strong voice power especially in queue where we our rose was like um just a just a hotline where everyone is like doing things together mm. what do you mean by the bottom up top down like what are you referring to um, i am probably referring to the the voice power of the so being a leader voltage. means that you had power in china um yeah in some sort of way okay um i mean we don't have a very strong election campaign it's not the way it works we mm. just deliver a speech amongst the student body and i i'm not really sure about the process but i guess the teachers have a much higher say than the actual students okay and how many people are out of the cohort actually wanted a leadership role because i imagine there's not mm -hmm. you know, like in america like mm -hmm. when you apply for uni you need extracurricular yeah, you, need you need leadership need but in china you don't necessarily need that ah uh, yeah that's a good point um um well it's not it's it's like a very minority of students who are heading for those roles mm. because those are people who are like who are like me who like want to engage in extracurriculars mm. but the vast majority they are like discouraged by their parents or discouraged <coughs> by their even time teachers away from yeah studying. it is it is i find it quite disappointing though mm. okay and um even though mm -hmm. Even though you had these leadership roles, you still did a extra stuff. Like, I believe you were, um, were you, like, doing, like, math competitions, like, science, technology? Like, tell tell me about your, like, <laughs> super curriculars, as I would call it. <laughs> oh, yeah, super curriculars. Well, the math thingy, uh, well, it's also a ticket to uni, you know. So... So the vast majority of the students in China, they're doing Gao Gao, but they're like those super smart students who are like more specialized in math, STEM than in say Chinese and um, and uh, English or all the others. So they have this special, special wrong way where they can get really high marks in those Olympic um, academic competitions and then they can enter good unis straight away. Um, so I was part of that and I was one of the two girls in the school math team of say 20-ish people. Mm. Yeah. And as you approached end of high school, like, mm -hmm. where did you see your strength, like personal strength? Like, what were you good at and what were you proud of? Right, so the big thing, the big thing about me is that I transferred from Gao to an international school system. When did you have to make that decision? Um, when I finished my first year at high <coughs> school. Um, it was a very big decision for me, but I considered my strengths. Um, so in the Gao system, I was, um, I stood out because I have all those activities and say leadership. Um, so I feel like being responsible for my choices, have a clear aim or goal is my strength. Mm. But after I transferred to the international system, especially when I compared to myself to the top students at, say, metropolitan cities, mm. 
um, in this new evaluation system, I felt um, not that competitive in that sense. Mm. I saw a lot of students who did well in their academics, but more in their actual curriculars. Right. Okay. Yeah. And was it a tough decision choosing the international system, or was it pretty straightforward? It was tough. Um, I had this huge opportunity cost of Gaokao, where I sort of think I can do well in that as well. Um, but I feel like going international, seeing the greater world, and you know, at the age of eighteen, going to a foreign university, a foreign country, and seeing the greater world around me is more important. Than staying the neighborhood that I am、mm. really familiar with. And were you set on UK, or、mm-hmm. did you also think about US and reuniting with your Year Four classmates? <laughs> <laughs>、um, I was initially set for UK,、um, because I didn't have that much of extracurriculars, and also US is sort of not so safe as UK compared comparatively.、Mm. So, but I also applied to US unis and got、um, I. I sort of applied just like the top tier and got rejected for all. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Um, you're just gonna have to settle for Cambridge. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay, and then, when you finish high school,、mm-hmm. what month and year was it? Like, did you get a little gap between finishing school and coming to uni? I finished school at June two thousand twenty two and came here at October. So between that, I was catching up with my friends, seeing a lot of my families, and then thinking about my career choices, getting really anxious about entering the grown up world of, say, finance or just career.、Mm. Yeah. And um. What did you like? You you know, lots of your、mm-hmm. friends would have gone to Chinese unis,、mm-hmm. and you're obviously going to Cambridge.、Yeah. How did you envision? And even now, perhaps, like, how do you vision the path between you and them divulging and changing? Like, what what are your anticipations of the future relative to the part the road that you could have or perhaps should have taken? Yeah, this divergence has been a really grand topic for me, and、um, that's constantly causing me pain in high school. So, I felt to have a similar <coughs> identity to those kids at my international school because. Um, honestly, my aim was sort of,、um, you know,、um, I my interests like are like in the books, in philosophy, in those sort of stuff. But I don't find many people who share similar interests. Well, I feel much more resonance with my friends at Gaokao,、um, but we departed, and yeah, it was such a good grand topic for me at that time. And during my reflections, I feel like. It feels like my my life is two years ahead of theirs. So during my during high school, I, during my first year of high school, I was constantly doing my IELTS and stuff. Whilst when they graduate, when my friends doing Google, they graduate from high school. They started upon like looking at IELTS and TOEFL, and I started pondering about my careers before uni, and that's something for them after their second year at uni. So I find it quite interesting. Um, yeah, that's one aspect, and another is that,、um, you know, still in Chinese unis, I feel like they're more toxic in competition, and also they have to do a lot of chores that are unnecessary, so like、um, learning political classes or something like that.、Um, Yeah, I find whilst in Cambridge we have more autonomy over our own studies. You could, you don't get punished、um, when you don't go to lectures, right? But in China that's not the case.、Um, if you don't go, if you don't go there,、um, the lecturers will take your name down, and then you will have your tutor talking to you, asking、At、for、uni. reason. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I thought in like uni in China, like it becomes much more chiller compared to like high school. Like Liu Shifer once said, like you know, it's just you just need to pass. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a air of, I mean that's the psychology of students. But I think the system works not in that way because, um, you still have to have this more of a top down approach where your tutors or your、um, teachers are really responsible for your choices in some sort of way. So in China, like、mm-hmm. obviously, I know you didn't go to uni there. Yeah. What were 
seen as like ideal or aspire towards career path like you know like say in australia lots of people want to do like uh-huh. medicine law oh. engineering what was like the high was there a hierarchy of preferences of what is good or like inverted commas like what is good <laughs> okay so you do have a hierarchy um when you finish gal call you're sort of choosing your major out of nowhere you so you prioritize uni over major you you're better off going to a better uni but so-called worse major than a better major at a worse uni i i imagine that's the way it works but i'm not really sure but okay. you have to consider your gal call results the scores those are the most important mm. and then you consider which schools can your scores reach and then you sort of because because you don't actually get your results when you apply right um you have to like guess what you're gonna get and then if you miscalculate then you could yeah that's sort of the way it works yeah and i think the biggest biggest problem with that is that students don't get the opportunity in their high school high school to explore around different majors sure. different fields of study yeah. so they're like choosing their majors out of nowhere and that's huge inefficiency evolved. Mm. So, yeah. Um, okay, so assuming someone gets mm-hmm. a good score. And, yeah, I guess still back to that question. Like, what is oh, what yeah. is the hierarchy of sort of missed it. good careers? Mm-hmm. So the hierarchy of majors is like, say, finance related, economics, um, STEM, okay. say, computer science, because those are like really employable, really employable subjects. And then you have it down there. So I think a lot of Chinese people, they're really, they, they, they're just super obsessed of making a hierarchy, like comparing things around. Mm. Even, you know, MBTI, yeah. they have a hierarchy for that as well. Really? Like on the Chinese version of Quora, wow. they're like, which one is more like competitive, which really like... Which is better personality. Yeah, it's like, wow. which one is more uh, strong at work? And there are people leaving comments like, stop it you don't want to foster that kind of competition between mbti as well <laughs> yeah so we do have a hierarchy where were you amongst the hierarchy that's a good question um i'm not really sure about that honestly because i left at a re- relatively early yeah so you mentioned like this internal competition nature and quite a few yeah. times mm-hmm. did that worry you when you were in that system and did it bother you and does it annoy you? And are you just glad that you're almost escaping a little bit of that? Um, so the time I was there, I didn't feel much of it because the competition wasn't that overwhelming at my year. Um, well, whilst I was there. But as, clo- as you went closer to Gao Kao, as the competition got more toxic. Mm. And the way I think about it right now is like, I am in this outside world looking back at my home country where there is this sort of problem or um, social phenomenon going on, I don't think it's good. Mm. I feel like there's sort of some responsibility in me that I want to make a change to it, but mm. I just still don't know how. Mm. I'm trying to figure out a way or just just to learn the reality mm. more. Okay. And when you say like toxic, mm-hmm. is there like, is it, like, it, it, does it just feel toxic or is it actually, are there like bad behavior? Like, what, what does that mean? Mm. So firstly, inefficiency, because you're doing, doing thing A for a ticket to thing B, but doing thing A just don't add to your strengths. So that's what we call inefficiency. Mm. And it just, it's not productive. And at the same time, um, okay, so in CM we have five, good high schools yep. and we tend to so schools tend to give us actual lessons during winter vacation and summer mm. vacations so once one school started doing that the others will follow it's like in a game uh, in a in game theory it's like ended up on the competitive equilibrium but it's like delivering social inefficiency outcomes right right yeah. okay and um coming to cambridge then mm-hmm. Was there another cultural shock or were you more prepared this time now that you're older? I am never prepared, I'd say. Um, I was quite bold in my first year. I got myself into a lot of societies because I was like quite nerdy during high school. So I feel like I'm probably overcompensating. Um, yeah, 
I got my hands around a lot of work and good people and sort of sacrificing my degree in some extent. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, speaking of the cultural shock, I, I feel like the local students, they are really chill about their life choices mm. um, because I think it's, it's that they're accustomed to them being responsible for their choices and they always have this kind of autonomy and freedom whilst um, for me it's like entering this new world where I've got so many opportunities I started off jumping at almost every one of them but now I realize that the most important thing is like rejecting some of the opportunities that's the key what have you rejected well good question um, so th- there was this water sprite film festival I was really interested in it but i just feel like i don't have enough mm. time for it i'm not really capable yet because mm. it's really huge event so if you yeah. were quite nerdy in high school and you mm. wanted to overcompensate yeah did you like when you were walking around fresh as all of their opportunities mm-hmm. did you kind of already know what you would like to take up or were you also quite open-minded at the start of oh that sounds interesting i never thought about that let's give that a go like what was your mindset when you were presented with a plethora of very diverse opportunities. There's almost everything there. Uh-huh. So I sort of have two groups of choices. One is must do, one is I want to do. So the must do's include, well, career societies that I, I sort of knew that if I kick off my career explore, explorations as early as possible, I'll end up in a good place. And the want to do is like, what well, makes my life happy and significant? So those are like, say trinity science society is it what it called it's like exploring more subjects because i know that um cambridge or uk universities in general are more specialized we don't have that sort of um open curriculum at the start so yeah say arts and music and uh, those other subjects outside of economics um are, are those i want to do okay and, mm-hmm. and um, what did you end up like do you, do you want to list out all the things that you have been involved in at uni just to yeah, capture your sure. recording? Yeah, sure. So, so for the career ones, I'm I'm doing SIBS, Cambridge Investment Banking Society. Um, it's like probably the most efficient society I've ever been, like one of. Um, so like people have a very well structured routine. It's like the finest wives. And also I have Q, sort of like at the intersection. It's like the sweet spot between career, like must do and want to do, because I feel like startup is really my passion. And also fifth, females in finance, which I'm doing with Linda, who's been on this podcast. podcast. Yeah, listen to her podcast, by the way. (laughs) She's like talking on this topic of academia versus finance. One topic that I'm really interested in as well. But anyways, back to the topic. So those two. And... uh, those three or, or yeah and also for the like my passions part um chinese debate society and also the recent one fitzwilliam museum society where i'm just hanging out with some arts people arts and humanities people did you win your campaign or so you were running for treasurer or sponsorship oh uh, yeah treasurer yeah. um i sort of ran a campaign for that but it was like it's not that competitive you got it uh, yeah i got Congrats. it well done. <laughs> thank you <laughs> Okay, and um, did anything about Cambridge or yourself mm-hmm. in this first year surprise you? Surprise me? Um, well, I wasn't, su- say, surprised because I know that if there is a consequence, there must be a reason. So for myself, I didn't get that much time into my studying and I sort of made the conscious decision that I put more efforts into societies and people. Yeah. And another thing is that I was looking forward to a community of great people, great intellectual minds at Cambridge. Is that meant? I feel like that's meant. I was expecting it. And yeah, I'm super grateful to have a group of very intellectual, cha- intellectually challenging friends around me who constantly in- inspire me and encourage me. So part of being intellectually challenged is mm-hmm. that our assumptions are questioned and some of the thoughts that we hold perhaps no longer hold true. Mm-hmm. What have you changed your mind on? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I what have you quick. changed your mind on? Like, ah, oh, your... okay. <laughs> right. That's a good question. Um. Mm, so I'm constantly reflecting upon my country, home country, China. So I feel like I'm in this very sweet, sweet spot where I'm having this outside of you. I'm away, so I get to see my country from. Um, a lot of like Western medias as well as Chinese medias and also my friends around me, like say those people from Hong Kong. And yeah, my views has changed a lot. So I, I still remember the first time I, I was reading The Economist during my high school. I felt a bit offended, you know, the views are quite um, brutal. They're quite towards one side. Um, but then I became like more open-minded upon different voices. I'm still trying to grasp, you know, my own view towards all the politics going on and my pos the position of those different countries in the world, in the new world order. But yeah, it's just a topic I'm constantly thinking that has evolved a lot. But now I'm like more open-minded. I don't have a stance yet because I feel like I'm not that capable of making my judgment yet but we'll see and um do you having been a part of different groups and societies mm -hmm. do you feel like like stereotypes with certain people are true like are the investment banking people just very finance bro vibes <laughs> and other q people just very entrepreneurial yeah. vibes or or is that overstated i feel like that is really overstated um one thing that I find really fascinating is that many of the Cambridge people, they have a, such, you know, the depths of their personality or character is way more than you could imagine. So I mentioned to you this friend's, friend's um, his band's open performance, like first performance yesterday. So I met him at the Credit Suisse networking events. And then I just... I just realized that he's been involved in so many like musical stuff and other stuff like that. So there is certainly a stereotype. If you believe in it, then I think it just gets stronger and stronger. But if you really take the time to look at those people, to really know their life story, then you'll find that we all have different faces, different aspects, different hats on. Yeah. And for you, um, you've, you've worked on startups, you've won, I think, the, was it the Fit Accelerate competition? I, yeah, I didn't win it. It's like oh, my okay. first um, pitch. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was your startup? Who was on your team? And um, <laughs> yeah, tell me about your business experiences. Yeah, it was basically just a group of friends who are like really interested in startup because we all enjoy the process of making our vision something, some make, making it into a reality. So we had Shen in our team who is also in this podcast, listen to his podcast, by the way, I'm doing a lot of advertisement for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have Shin and we have Ryan, Sam, blah, blah, blah. Those are like econ, econ bros. <laughs> 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 yeah, so basically it's about like, one thing we realize in Cambridge is that our, our um, contain or the foothold system is not really efficient because we're like relying on the professional knowledge of the say catering managers rather than something digital or automatic so we're trying to um, solve this problem by delivering this automatic system where we can have a pooled knowledge base for all the colleges in Cambridge and yeah we're trying to use uh, more advanced technology to make the process more efficient how did you come up with the idea or the how did you identify the problem we were just sitting together as a John's cafe and random brainstorming and then we just came up with it. Okay. So it's more like you wanted a startup, then you look yeah. for a problem rather than you saw a problem, then you're like, let's fix it. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And what did you hope to get out of that experience? To um, be multi billionaires? <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. So the, well, the more selfish aim is that we can get some experiences outside of this startup, like how we nurture something from zero to, say, making an impact or making the actual viable products. And aside of that, it's just, you know, we are Cambridge and we want to do something for this community. It's like by Cambridge for Cambridge. And 
in the process of talking to those um, catering managers at uh, say Emma or Trinity, we find it like those people are really supportive of our ideas. They gave many advices, although they're like really busy with their work and we are really, really grateful for that. And also I think most fundamentally it's, ju it's just about friends coming together, doing cool stuff. And I think that's it. Mm. It's just, we were like having our brainstormings, doing stuff together and we just grab McDonald's or stuff. It's like typical startup vibes, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And you very much, um, so, so I mean, so, so, so when you have something like this, it's almost mm -hmm. like your baby, like it's your unique project yeah. and you having like being a female CEO, as you mentioned in the bio, it yeah. clearly is something that you're quite proud of and understandably so. What does it like personally mean to you that you as an international student female could do something like this and own something quite cool like does it give you confidence does it motivate you to work harder does it yeah what, what, what did it what did having that title and having this experience <laughs> mean to you personally so initially it was just me and um four of my male friends so initially it was self-taught what yeah. makes me special or like the middle person who bring together a group of really talented gifted friends it's like i'm the only female in this team what's my what, what are my strengths is because obviously everyone has their own specializations and after this period of self-doubt i realized that it's probably because um i'm like the say middleman or or like um, I bring those fascinating ideas together. It's like intermediate. That's how I position myself. And yeah, I think, well, I suppose I have a um, broader or stronger emotional capa capacity to, you know, cater for everyone's needs. I mean, just to bring them together, to stick them around together. So I think that's my uh, capacity here. And after that, um, I feel like, it's not it's it's sort of confidence because i am the minority in this group because if you look at q like say the 20k competition and other startup events it's like quite male dominated and it just gives me the spur of reflection of how do i position myself as a female in this grown-up world or the startup or finance world where females like seen as minorities so I began to reflect upon my, say, career choices, family choices, and yeah, I say it just comes back to the reflection and gives right. me a lot so of thought. What do you feel like, like, given your positionality, you, you know, mm -hmm. you mentioned as a female, yeah. Do you feel like you fit the mold or do you, are you trying to actively break the mold and what is the mold and just where do you sit in that framework or the stereotype and yeah um so initially i was trying to like vibing with my friends so <laughs> yeah so we were like more reckless we were like so when i was hanging out with my uh female friends we were like um feeling cute most of the time <laughs> but we, well, with my friend, like with my uh, male friends, they're like hanging out, doing playing games, Minecraft and stuff, and they're like trying to invite me into their games, and I I find it quite interesting though. So, yeah, initially it's it's like trying to be a part of them. I'm I'm intentionally, you know, breaking apart from my uh, say more s sens sen sensitive, um, sensitive version of myself. And to join them but after that i try to reflect upon what are my strengths once again and then yeah that's sort of striking an equilibrium between my uh, mm. identity and the environment around me mm. but like mm -hmm. what do you think females like in minorities mm -hmm. um, maybe in the chinese culture maybe just yeah. universities in general what kind of expectations do females have? Like, what social pressures do they face, and how do you approach that? Like, do you try and overcome it? Do you try to resist it, or do you feel like you're 
yeah, part of if do you get what I'm saying? Like I sort of get it. Like, you know, some uh-huh. females may feel like they need to be not as career ambitious, they need to be more family driven, they need uh-huh. to do cooking. Uh huh. Or they need to not pursue life. That they should look at like social side of things, like how do you how do you see society's expectations on females and where do you see yourself positioned in face of that expectation? Um, so as you mentioned, the society has certain expectations on female like families and instead of say careers mm. being more um like the emotional process and the say physical or mental mm. side of things. Um but I think that kind of that kind of vibe is really not really the case in Cambridge and not really in the, in the environments that I grew up because I've seen so many fascinating girls at Cambridge that they're really striving and um, the key that the key is I'm not emphasizing like the divide or the false dichotomy between male and female it just turns out in the way that we're like having this physical trait different from one another what I'm trying to say is that um, the key is to like reflect on the system and to see where we stand. That does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sort of. Um but do you feel like females uh-huh. in China and females in the West uh-huh. face different expectations? Hmm. Um so so we have to talk about feminism. So I feel like feminism at the core is like the equality amongst the sexes. And I think fem- feminism in Western countries are generally more advanced than that in China. So in the Western world, I believe um, due to the more economically advanced um, characteristic, um, they have more resources, say, to give to those sort of campaigns and whilst in China um, it's more like people are it's not actually debating it's just quarreling on the internet people are like trying to bump each other punch each other without a very sensible discussion um, I am constantly thinking that it might be a necessary stage in the development of feminism where you first have that kind of um, emotional awakening, then you enter a very um, serious intellectual discussion. But I'm not really sure about that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, you mentioned this, maybe not dichotomy, but mm-hmm. this balancing act of yeah. career and family. Yeah. Obviously, you're very young. And you're just starting uni. Yep. Um, I'm assuming you're not married. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm not. Um, how do you right now envision your future? Like, do you want to have a family? Do you want to be married? Is there an age that you want to be married by or don't want to marry by? Like, uh-huh. what are you currently thinking? <laughs> okay, that's a very interesting question. So, I do want a family. Um. I think family is a place where you are loved unconditionally and that is important to me to offer love to others and to receive love so I do want it but I don't have much of an idea towards what age say to whom or the meaning of marriage so I think most of the time people are like over romanticizing marriage saying that it's like this is the person I want to have this life forever contract that I want to be with this person together but when it boils down as a core it's just something that that makes your relationship more stable right if you have a children say you have a child you have children um it helps to avoid you know someone sort of running off. <laughs> yeah someone running off so if you I mean if I see this aspect of marriage like the more utilitarian part of it and I mean the romantic part of it I can have other sort of contracts with my partner that's not involved in marriage I can trust them I can give them trust we have it's not like necessarily enforced by legal relationships 
So in that sense, um, are you saying you might mm -hmm. not be married but still have a relationship because you feel like marriage is just a legal binding thing? That is my uh, young rebellious version of it. It might change in the future. But so no. right now, you right might now. not be married. You think it's not like not. Um, I'm not sure yet, honestly. Okay. I might so you're not. open to the. Yeah, I'm open to all sorts of possibilities. But does it yeah. have to be a monogamous relationship? Or... Um, I feel like monogamous relationships are more stable. Um, so open relationships, you have many people involved sometimes. I don't know. I, I feel like I just feel more self-secure when I direct all my love securely to like mm -hmm. this sole person. Um, I mean, yeah, it just makes life easier. For Do me. you as a woman feel... Mm -hmm pressure to start a family by a certain age and you know with, with i don't really want to debate whether the biological <laughs> clock is real but do you feel <laughs> do you feel some sense of pressure um not yet my family is more open-minded upon that um compared to the society average and i feel like in my personal aspirations i might want to do some cool stuff um, like show myself and my work or my personal ambitions before I start a family with those heavy commitments. But I feel like having a family is something that I'm looking forward to. Mm. Having the love and say a harbor. Mm. And obviously being an international student mm -hmm. as well, this, you know, you got home at multiple places, different yes. communities and different culture. Yeah. Do you think for your family, like, would you mainly obviously mm -hmm. when you meet someone lots of different <laughs> things happen but yes do you feel like it would have to be an asian family a chinese family where would you be open-minded for a very mixed family um i say i'm quite open-minded but the fact is we have all sorts of cultural barriers and things just turn out more easily if, if you, you can both speak the language yeah we ha you have the same language you have the same alert upbringing mm. okay. does all this p thinking about family and career does it excite you or don't you or overwhelm you like how do you feel about these big life choices like, <laughs> they're, they're massive like who you date and who you spend time with like that's arguably one of the biggest most influential decision that you will ever make mm. i feel like <coughs> when i make decisions i'm all I'm always, nearly always overthinking. I want to weigh all the costs and benefits, have all the information to Try myself. model everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, but now I feel like sometimes it's just your instincts that will lead you on the way. And instead of doubting whether this is the best decision I can make, I think more about whether you have the courage to stay on the path you choose. It's, a lot, it's about sticking to your choices and leaving it to the best rather than choosing the right path i suppose and right now what do you see as your path mm. to stick on a path you need to know what, at least what direction you're heading yeah. where are you going <laughs> okay i have this vague impression that um after say after these three years at cambridge i might want to learn more about the world more than compared to like changing the world and entering the workforce. I, I'm still constantly fascinated by humans. So I might want to study, say, sociology, anthropology, that sort of things. And economics just leave me, a, leave me in a very good position where I have a, say, comparatively um, impactful mindset that I can get to think about those issues. And after that, I might enter a workforce to train my skills and then in the medium run, I might do something like startups where I can really deliver my skills and do something I am really ambitious about. But in the long run, I feel like it's giving back to the society, leaving some legacy in those world, say education. Like the Janine scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, so if we do a thought experiment, fast forward okay. a decade, a decade and a half when you mm -hmm. actually do have a family you have kids <laughs> would you be open to staying at home or do you feel like in the modern world like there's no reason why you need to 
prioritize family any more than your spouse? Hmm. Um, I think I will negotiate with my spouse before we have any children. Good luck to your spouse. I know you've done negotiation. <laughs> I know you, you taught negotiation skills. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love the use of the word negotiation. <laughs> Sounds so so formal, but yeah. <laughs> How we dis- divide our roles. I mean, we are a family. We have different division of labor. So <laughs> we'll see. Um. Yeah. I, I, I think it will just de- depend on the actual circumstances where mm. our preferences, our skill sets. So I'm open to all possibilities. And. Obviously, you're open to all possibilities, but mm-hmm. where do you, where, like, location-wise, do you location perhaps wise. see your future? UK, China, back to Xi'an, uh, America, <laughs> um, Australia, Africa, Antarctica, like, where, where do you see yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure yet. So, the biggest thing about China is my family and the culture. Yep. So, I don't want to leave my parents alone there. Yep. I... I want to take them to see the larger world, but at the same time, I just wanted to give them company. Yep. So that is a big undecided thing. Give them company or a company? Um, <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's about me. And yeah, I have this dream of traveling the world before I have any children. So it's like more bun- unbounded. Do you want to travel with them? I'm actually thinking, you know, people actually do this stuff where they homeschool their children, take their children on, around the world tour. I'm not really sure if I'm capable for that, but I, I feel like it's something really cool that I really want to do. But before that, I might, I must have financial means for that. <laughs> you so if know? you do have the total financial, say uh-huh. you win the lottery now, okay. you know, 200 million, so you don't really have to worry <laughs> about. Okay. How would your life change? Like, would you want to start a family now? Would you, like, yeah, how does removing any financial barriers change your decisions now because the economic models the assumptions change that the models change (laughs) okay um so the thing about money is that there are a means of payments it doesn't represent anything um so i feel like there is just like the purchasing power that gives me access to say achieving my hobbies or my dreams so if i really do have this helicopter money hmm um I don't think my life will change in the big way, honestly. Wow. I still enjoy doing my own stuff, like doing things from scratch. I yes. think that's what gives my life meaning. And having more money will just make me um, more chilled when making, say, choices about like traveling or buying books that I enjoy. Mm. You still work pretty hard, you think? Yeah. yeah. I think that's a part of me that is really innate. Mm. Is there anything, like, you feel like you need to, like, just saying you mentioned how mm-hmm. before you have children, you feel like you want to travel the world and see yeah. the world. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that you feel like on the bucket list that you just need to tick and do? <laughs> um, before I have children? No, just or any, in life, just you, oh, what you, you need like. to do. Okay. Uh, good question. So, travel around the world. Um giving back to society in some way i feel like i might end up in education i am just always fascinated by the way that how you can impact another person about their views towards the world their personality their mm. characters well, education is a very broad field in the broad world what, what do you mean by okay. being involved in education um so my mom has this dream of starting a xi wang xi wang it's like a charity hope, hope primary school. <laughs> hope primary school she want me to give her funding if i have the money so that's one thing I might do for my mom. What does that mean, a Hope Primary School? So she wants to start this charity school, say, in the unrepresented <coughs> areas, say, the rural areas, where children, they have a thirst for learning, but they just don't have the resources. And she just wants to help them, to teach them, to impact them. Yeah. And say, for myself, um. I feel like probably at university, because like people are more grown up, rather than say middle school or primary school where like kids are too noisy and messy. I'm just not really capable for that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think like uni, you, you can, you know, you can get into all sort of 
um, depths in conversations and also like different fields. I think mm. that's really amazing. But back to money. You, yeah. You, 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 you define the role of money or you conceptualize it as mm-hmm. a means to to pursuing your goal and to access opportunity. Um, do you believe that like the current economic model and capitalism mm-hmm. especially is the best way to either allocate capital on a society level or for individuals to live a flourishing, worthwhile life? Like, is the current system the best way? Okay, that is one big question. You're basically saying that it's, say, capitalism is the best way of resource allocation. Is that the question you're... Yeah, either for society or individual. Is it best for individuals? Um, That is a constantly debated topic in economics. So... If we trace back to the past of capitalism, we can see the period of colonialization, the initial accumulation of capital has involved a lot of casualties, a lot of, um, say, you know, imagine that past. And, but capitalism, it certainly fosters incentives. People wanted to work hard. And also the byproducts um, involves some say uh, individual choices individual freedom but at the same time we have social inequalities because the current situation is that the capitalist capitals tends to end up in the hands of the minority you can see the widening of the inequality gaps especially in countries such as the us so for myself i am i'm just first in economics i'm constantly thinking about those those topics uh, my stance is that when we consider efficiency, output, GDP, we must think about equity, development, and all those things that just make us human. So going back to the topic of what is the best way of resource allocation, I feel like nowadays in the world, there are too many confrontations, too many battles. Um, people, are, people are trying to yell at each other, each other saying that we are the best system on the world, we are better than you. It's like constantly comparing one to another. But I feel like this is just losing track. I mean, as economists, we are trying to decide what is the best elements in each system and say how each system can learn from one another so we can say collectively put together a better system for the economists to evolve. It's not ab- about confrontations and comparisons. It's about, say, unionization, having an open mindset. So as someone who has fully immersed in the China- Chinese culture mm-hmm. and the Eastern kind of way of thinking, yeah. and then now coming to the West where you read, as you mentioned, like economist articles and your, your views have kind of changed, yeah. do you almost see yourself as a bridge between to seemingly um, reckon it a uh, uh, seemingly irreconcilable divide, and like, do you see your future as one where you can contribute towards fostering this ideal vision that you just talked about, where it's less yelling, more understanding, more empathy, and more collaboration. So speaking of this divide, one thing that I do realize is that we are more similar than we are unlike. So no matter which part of the world we lie in, we all share similar values. We all value love, friendship, um, a sense of community, all those qualities that really bring us back together. And there has been so many cases in the world where, say, soldiers from different countries in the war, they ended up understanding one another because they shared similar families, similar emotions. So for me, It's more about seeing the cross sections, the similarities, and then to rethink about the differences. So I think the major differences are the social systems, the cultural values, social constructs. Um, I mean, if I were to contribute to something, I hope it's not something really political. Um, I don't want to take a strong stance upon that, but rather I want to see 
where I can, what I can do for the, say, the common good or the intersection of all humans without their political beliefs or those mandated divides. So something I still say on this mm -hmm. idea of like similarity and differences. Yeah. Something that I guess really shaped my childhood and I guess mm -hmm. continually shaped my yeah. worldview being born in Xi'an is, mm -hmm. you know, the history. Yes. Like, you know, I grew up listening to like Ping Shu, like, you know, yeah, San Guo, Shu Hu, <laughs> Yang Jia Jiang, uh -huh. Yue Fei, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. And it was just so powerful seeing the humanness, like, of, of the bonds, you know, like, you know, Liu Bei Guan Yu Jia Fei, for example, yeah, like, you yeah, know, yeah. how they, the brotherhood and the sacrifice brotherhood. they would have on each other. Exactly. The sense of camaraderie and loyalty towards yeah. your nation or your mm -hmm. group. Along with the strategies that are, you know, as a child is eye opening, thinking about ways of utilizing soldiers like Kun Cheng Ji, for example, like that reverse <laughs> psychology. Yeah. Like as a child, I was so fully immersed in listening to Chinese history and yeah. thinking about what it means to, you know, family values, social values, ambition, greed. You know, I feel like that gave me the full spectrum of the human experience. Full spectrum, that's a word. Right now, I feel like our generation, perhaps because of economic circumstances, etc., most of those traditional values are revered and admired, but they're not really taught or at least lived out necessarily. So as someone who grew up in Xi'an, I'm sure you're far more well-versed in ancient Chinese history than I am. Do you feel like we as a society now are also more similar than different to those ancient civilizations and their ways of living and their ways of conceptualizations of life? Um, are we talking about like China or like... I guess China in particular. In, China. Okay, China in particular. So I remember this saying that my politics teacher told us. So those people in the past they're like but nowadays people are like mm. so in translation in the past people are like they believe in something so they see the world as it is and nowadays people are like seeing the world and then they formulate their own beliefs so I think that in the past people are like there are a lot of good qualities such as say zhong yi xiao cheng those qualities that you just mentioned but nowadays we're like I don't know materialistic yeah we're like optimized societies but I mean that that is like the I feel like it's an inevitable consequence of a society when you're more economically developed um it tends to emphasize um, your individual freedom or individualism. You want to be independent in your decision making rather than making grand decisions in terms of a one whole house, household or a, as a greater system or community. So that is part of the economic development. But at the same time, I believe the traditional values embedded in Chinese culture is more influential than we constant than we that that is constantly believed. So a lot of Westerners ask, do you have a say religion in China? And well Buddhism is ori oriented in say uh India, it's not like China. We have Ru Jia Lenghua, it's like Confucius thinking. It is like the Chinese version of religion, but it's not like that systematic enough to be one religion and i think Ru Jia Lenghua is having this huge impact on the social and political structure what of is, china like to for people who don't know yeah. what is the core tenets of Ru Jia Lenghua so it's quite difficult to formulate um Ru Jia Lenghua has this um this sort of um characterization of human relationships it's like jun jun chen chen fu fu zi zi. it's like those kind of hierarchy of relationships like you have um relationships with your say boss or emperor uh, you have 
that with your father, your siblings, your son or children. So it's emphasizing this sense of community or collective thinking. You are more bonded. And then it's fostering values amongst those relationships such as zhong yi. It's like you have to stay loyal to your boss. You have to um you have to give back to your families, your parents. Um you have to be honest with your friends. Those kind of values. And yeah, those kind of household way of thinking, I think it's really pervasive in China nowadays albeit the presence of individualism. So one thing that I, that I do notice is that uh, most Westerner students, they go to uni by issuing student debt, like loans. But in China, it's like family funded. We are more dependent on our family. And in, in return, we are more bonded to them when we grow up. Um, after our parents retire, um, we usually give give them money or care for them um, like in a very heavy way it's like more responsibility yeah and this is like in the microscopic level and in the macro level it's more like um, the sense of community or collective decision making in China is more pervasive than here in the UK what do you personally prefer? Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say there are good things and bad things about each system. So in China, it's more like you have ban or bondings. That gives you more sense of belonging, but at the same time, more responsibility. But in the West, it's like you are free as yourself. Um, so I think on that level, it's not easy for me to make a decision. But if you recall to the back of Chinese history where you have a system of lian zu, lian zhu jiu zu, where if one person in this family do something, say, bad, then his whole family is going to get punished. It's like the family didn't do anything, but they're like taking consequences for this individual. I think this sort of um, social governance system is sort of toxic in that sense. Okay. And do you feel like, mm -hmm. you know, how do you envision the next kind of generation of Chinese <laughs> children growing up? Like, would they be even more individualistic or would they perhaps revert back to more of the community mindedness? And what's your kind of prediction for? Like, because if you want to go back to China, mm -hmm. right, and you have a kid yeah. there, then your kids are going to grow up in this new environment. What do you anticipate is in it for them? So nowadays, children get access to the wider world around them at such an early age. They have phones, they have TikTok. So I'd say they're more individualized in some sense. Um, they have their own independent thinking. They want to rebel against their parents, their teachers a lot. But at the same time, um, in the school education, we are taught about values, about like nationalism or, um, you know, loving the country and stuff. So honestly, I don't know. It's like striking a balance and I imagine it difficult for the children. You know, on the one hand, they are seeing this wider world around them. They want to be themselves. But at the same time, the school is like um, pushing those values amongst them. What would you advise your kids then? If, if, if... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'll just wait and see how things go. How the this divide, you know. Like right now, if you mm -hmm. had a kid who's in primary school, what would you <laughs> tell him or her? How I say he's knowing what you know now and what makes yeah. a good life and the opportunity. Like, mm -hmm. what would you tell them? So. So given the situation that me and my family, my child is living in China, we are under the system and given the situation that I'm not making any changes to them, um, I would just tell my kid to see this system, to see how the system operates upon her, him or her and make his own decisions under it, just to see the rules. And at the same time, as a parent, 
I believe I will respect his or her own choices or minds. That's, I think, the best I can do. And would you say what you just said is very much what your parents mm -hmm. did or encouraged in you? Or do you think your parenting style would be quite different to theirs? I think it's quite similar. My thinking and my mom and my dad's thinking. Mm -hmm. Just respect the child's own individual willingness. Well, we've talked about a lot in the context of giving you a legacy worthy interview, you know, a snapshot of what you're currently thinking and feeling, um, but also to give you a piece of recording that you can look back on in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years time. <laughs> um, I've got a couple to mm -hmm. wrap up, but do yeah. you have any like other things that you want to be featured in this recording or we can just wrap up? I just wanted to ask, what does love mean to you? What does love mean to me? Yeah. Um, I think love has many... It's obviously circumstantial. Yep. Because, you know, you can... Like we were talking about before, like I think a fundamental humanness across culture, across mm -hmm. circumstances, is that we want to love and be loved. And I think yes. both are equally as important. Mm-hmm. Um, be loved is quite simple where we want to be seen we want to be heard we want to feel like we we matter but part of feeling like we matter is also the opportunity to love to sacrifice and to feel like we can just give to someone something a wider course perhaps yep. without doing it for any materialistic reasons so i mm -hmm. think um love is in a sense unconditional unconditional um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's patient, mm -hmm. um, which relates to unconditional. It is kind and it's constantly thinking about the other perspective. It's sacrificial. Yeah. It's, I think love is perhaps the culmination of everything good. We can all debate on what is good and what is bad, but I think love is the ultimate peak of everything that is good and good is up to us to define and characterize and to shape and to interpret and to adapt depending on our life circumstances. Like in a war context, love might be very intense. It might be it's like sometimes maybe not loving is an act of love. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know that if you're a soldier, I'm just thinking in the Chinese context of, you know, ancient history, mm -hmm. if you're a general and you know that you're about to enter this war and you might likely to lose your life but you got this girl that you deeply love, maybe an act of love is not pursuing her. And because if you yeah. do pursue her, then she might end up as a widow. But in a modern context, maybe love is that you go above and beyond and show your love and to flower her with <laughs> compliments or good things. So I think it's yeah. very circumstantial, but the underpinning of it to me is the culmination of everything that is good. And what is good is up to each of us to interpret but love is the ultimate form of that i will define it at this point but i'm open to change i love your definition so much um a round of rapid fire questions then if sure. you're ready so just quick um, okay responses yeah sure um what's your like favorite month september <coughs> first day um favorite color favorite color is so many who do you text the most? Um, my boyfriend. Um, in China or Cambridge? Cambridge. Yes. Um, what's your like favorite breakfast? Um. Doujing, um, nice. la tang, some Chinese breakfast. Very nice. <laughs> um, how would you like describe your style in one word? Uh. Okay. Um, striving. I don't know. <laughs> striving to strive. What's one of your nicknames? Jen. Um, what's like the best investment that you've made that cost less than like a hundred dollars that had a disproportionate <laughs> impact on your life? Joining Q. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite board game? Monopoly. Finish the sentence. The way to my heart is... Love. 
Where was your first date? Can't remember. <laughs> um, Depending on how, how you define date, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever go on reality TV show? Not really. Favorite movie? Before Sunrise. Do you believe in ghosts? I do. Um, is there heaven? Yes. So your life doesn't end at this life. Um. It's something good to believe in. I don't want to consider the scientific facts. Would you ever have a tattoo? No, it hurts too much. <laughs> <laughs> um. Cats or dogs? Both. Money please. or happiness? Happiness. Love or friendship? It's it's a false dichotomy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um. Would you rather think or do? Think. Are you more cautious or bold? Bold. And the final <laughs> one is: What's the country that you would love to visit? That you haven't yet visited. Um, Iceland. Second to last, longer question. Um, sure. What do you think currently is the best diagnosis of the human condition? You know, is it a religion? Is it a school of thought? Is it a philosophy? Is it economic theories or model? But what best, in your opinion, resonates or resonates with you on the diagnosis of the full spectrum of human experience that we all share? I say music and art. It just embeds so many emotions and shared experiences across time, across spaces. Final question, I guess, when you think about your whole life, you know, um, being <laughs> a Xi'an, being okay. immersed in all that history, um, having that unstructured playtime on the weekend where your parents gave <laughs> you the freedom, yeah, where you had the chance to basically dictate your own study schedule where you mm -hmm. know that if you work hard during the week that you could have that period of rest with your dog, you know, exploring the city, trying to breathe in the air um, in primary school, then going to America for that one year, not really understanding what's going on, having <laughs> that cultural barrier, mm -hmm. spending time in the library because you were a bit lonely and trying to find <laughs> your way through, yeah. having that teacher to help you and I guess leaving that year being really touched by the necklace that they gave you and the one sentences that they all wrote. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can understand as a kid at that age, it, it means a lot to have that, um, to go back to China and be like very behind, but then needing to catch up and taking mm -hmm. on that challenge. But yet you have now had that perspective of seeing the world, mm -hmm. taking on the different extracurriculars at school with school leadership, taking on that project second year of middle school, the cultural heritage um, project, mm -hmm. volunteering with other people, giving your leadership speech, contemplating where your future is heading either with gold car or a level one choosing to go international to see the world um have been punched by your mum <laughs> <in the sense>. <laughs> <laughs> um i guess being valedictorian applying for cambridge you know going through that moment of realizing your parents unconditional love and just realizing just how much they care about your your happiness you know far beyond yeah. your academic career materialistic achievements but just for your internal well-being mm -hmm. <clears throat> coming to cambridge and feeling like you need to perhaps overcompensate as being a nerd <laughs> um and then be at career there having your distinctions of what you must do and what you want to do must do being your career is stuff and you think it's always good to think ahead and to explore different options and yeah. maybe in like the investment banking society mm -hmm. the entrepreneurship society mm -hmm. uh fits uh, Williams Museum, yeah. you know, running for election for treasurer, uh -huh. um, trying out new things like startup and trying to solve <laughs> problems, brainstorming with, with yeah. friends, being a female CEO, um, innovating, thinking about your positionality, I, th I guess being a female, what it means to defy stereotypes and what it mm -hmm. means to challenge the norms and what it means to um, think about careers and family and conceptualizing where you want your life to be and what does it mean to to live mm -hmm. um, up until now where you finish first year with different economic theories where you're still pondering about big questions about resource allocation and economic <laughs> models feminism different contexts what kind of daughter you want to be what kind of potential spouse you want to be how do you want to love and be loved 
when you take all that into account, what's one message, quote, or saying you wish I, every educator, kid, teacher, community leader across different cultures, across different faith, across different sexuality and all the d- distinctions that seem to divide us, what would you hope that they could promote and that every kid could internalise in a new, changing, evolving, adapting world order where really we don't know what will happen in the coming decade? What would you want them those kids growing up now to internalize or know? Becoming themselves. I think that's the most important thing upon life. Um, you, you just constantly reflect on who you want to be and actualize it. Constantly renew your belief in yourself. I think that's the most important thing. Well, it's been lovely meeting you, Junior. Same. I'm glad with Q and I think I've learned a lot from, very inspired by your wide range of experiences even amidst academic pressure and I think you're Thank someone you. who definitely tries to become not only become more of yourself but I, I love how you're thinking about paying it forward for the community and thinking about the next generation whether it's mum's ambitions of that hope primary school or your own perhaps ambitions of <clears throat> contributing in the field of education is really important I think that it is really cool that you recognize the many privileges that you have and the opportunities that you've been given and that you want to pay it forward. And I just wish that more of us, including me, could be more thoughtful and to be more caring for the wider community and those who are perhaps less privileged. So thank you for your example and for your inspiration. Thank you so much, David, for having me. This really means a lot.